Welcome to this webinar on effective lobbying. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, if you'd like to use the chat function to introduce yourselves, um, then please do. If you want to ask a question for any of our panelists, um, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, anything in the chat, unfortunately, won't be going through as questions. So use the Q&A and then we can ask all those questions at the end. Um, this session is being recorded so you should be able to view it afterwards online and we can share a link to that later. Um, unfortunately, Leila Moran has sent her apologies, which is a shame, um, but I'm sure Richard Benwell with his experience with Michael Gove can give some good insights into direct contacts with MPs. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, Estelle Bailey, um, Chief Exec of Barks, Books and Oxen Wildlife Trust, and um, say a few opening words. Thank you, Matthew, and good afternoon to everybody and a very warm welcome to you and particularly to our panellists as well, Richard Benwell, Caroline Culver and Val Sadiq. Thank you for attending. So this is a very important time for nature and wildlife amid ever-growing awareness of the ecological and climate catastrophe we're all facing. We have a number of extremely important high profile events taking place at the moment. The Environment Bill is currently working its way through Parliament. The G7 summit has just been in, uh, taking place in Cornwall and we've got COP26, which is going to take place in Glasgow later this year. And it's vital that we make the most of the opportunities these national and international events present. So for you, our members and supporters, you are our most effective weapon and we want you to help us fight this battle. So there are two possible barriers to getting involved in lobbying, and we're going to help you understand those today and pick up the tips, obviously, from, um, from our panellists. So you might not know how to go about it, and you might find the thought intimidating. So we want to help you overcome that today. And you might not believe that lobbying works despite our best efforts. It can sometimes feel as if we're getting nowhere, but I want to reassure you that lobbying really does work. For example, lobbying by the Wildlife Trust and our thousands of supporters has ensured that nature recovery networks are included in the Environment Bill. And local authorities will be ob obliged to create nature recovery strategies and legally binding targets for nature's recovery will be introduced. So it does work. Um, thank you very much for joining. We can't do this without you. So this is a rallying call from me and from BBAT and, and behalf of the Wildlife Trust, actually, because there are more people like you out there um, and we need to get you engaged and tooled up, ready for action. So over to Richard Benwell. Richard, welcome. Thanks so much, Estelle, and thanks, thanks, Matthew, for organising this event. Um, as Estelle says, it's absolutely crucial to get out and get speaking to your MPs right now. Uh, and by way of reassurance to begin with, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that none of our 650 MPs in Parliament at the moment woke up this morning and had a sort of uh, wicked Bond villain cackle to themselves and thought, I know what I'm going to do today. I'm going to destroy nature. Um, in the strange world of adversarial politics that we live in, where one party throws mud at the other party and uh, the media comes in and uh, dollops a whole load more on top, we have a tendency to sort of two dimensionalize our politicians and to turn them from human beings into uh, sometimes into comic book villains uh, and to think that um, the way to go about changing their minds is to um, berate, attack and use the, um, the force of a bludgeon to, to change their minds and to get them to do things. Uh, but if there's a message that um, I want to give you today, it's to remember that uh, MPs probably woke up this morning and just like you and me, probably uh, were struggling to make a decision about what to have for tea, let alone uh, think about some of the huge questions that are facing them. And if there's one thing that can help you to change an MP's mind and be an effective advocate for nature, it's to have some, some empathy. Uh, and remember that MPs have uh, a barrage, a bombardment of different interests 
uh, coming at them each day from all sides. They're faced by, they, know, they probably know there's an ecological and a climate emergency, but they're faced by an almost intractable problem of knowing what to do about it. Uh, and like the rest of us, they're faced with something that's enormous and terrifying uh, and don't quite know where they fit into the story of turning things around and what role they can play in fixing things. Uh, and we have a tendency to sort of simplify it and to say, politicians, you've got to act and stop the climate emergency now. You must save nature. But like the rest of us, knowing what that actually means for what they should do day to day is a really complicated question. And for us as advocates and lobbyists, we need to help to break that down and to provide them with the tools they need to become um, effective spokespeople for environmental improvement. So there's probably a, there's probably a masterclass out there somewhere from one of the big um, public affairs lobbying companies that tells you exactly how to go about it. But I would, I would suggest four ingredients will help you to, to go about effective lobbying for nature. First of all, to remember what MPs need, then, to remember what MPs can do. Third, to remember who they are. And fourth, to remember who we are. So I'll go through those speedily in turn. Um, and the first one, remembering what MPs need. I guess the, um, the, the most important ammunition for an MP to help them to do their job uh, is a combination of information and answers with political space. So as lobbyists, we can help to provide both. The, the, the easiest and simplest is that political oxygen that comes from public attention on an issue. When an MP speaks in the House or goes to their party to say, really, we should do this, the most effective thing that they can have behind them is the noise of public support. Every letter that you write to a political party um, tends to be logged somewhere in an MP's office and fed back to the central party. Those mailbag politics of the volume of interest in a subject really do get fed back into party HQs and really do get um, uh, weighed up as part of a political calculus about where um, MPs and parties can afford to spend their energy. So the very simplest thing that we can do is help to give them that um, political weight of public support. If you go to an MP and say you, you care about something, you've started off doing that. But the real magic, of course, is to be able to say, and so you should do this. And this is the bit that we all too often forget. We go to an MP and we say, you must do something about plastic pollution. You've got to do something about uh, the fact that 0% of our rivers are in um, uh, in good ecological condition. And they might well go, oh yes, I can see that. Yes, I should. But, but knowing what to do about it is a tremendously difficult question for MPs. They don't have easy levers to pull to suddenly make um, ecological condition improve. We need to go to them to equip them with the answers they need to uh, make a change. And that's where working with organizations like Bebout, who might be able to help you to spot, um, you know, we're talking about the environment bill, Estelle mentioned local nature recovery strategies. We, we might want to say to an MP, those have got to really mean something. And so if we go to them and say, well, hey, look in the environment bill and look at the duty to use local nature recovery strategies. And it's just a vague duty to think about them. Actually, that duty should be to take into account local nature recovery strategies in all planning and spending decisions. So you should change this clause of this bill in this way, and Bob's your uncle. Uh, and going armed with that kind of specificity of answer is the magic ingredient that turns us from um, lots of noise, which is helpful, to something more constructive, to give the MP what they need actually to go out and do something. Um, and it fits with what MPs want as well because most MPs are looking for things to be able to say. They're looking for causes to be able to stand up for. Um, and the facts, the answers, and the information that we provide are the, their currency in Parliament. 
information and arguments and answers are a political currency in Westminster that uh, an MP can cash in to uh, have time in front of the House and the Chamber. Uh, they can cash in as something that they're able to, to demonstrate action to their constituents. So it's that combination of ask and answer that gives them something that they can really use. Uh, and that brings me on quickly to, to point two, knowing what they can actually do is so important because most of the time backbench MPs can't simply solve an issue. They can't make a law themselves. What can they do? They can ask questions. They can ask questions of government. They can put in motions for a debate so they can suggest time for a parliament to consider stuff. And they can put in amendments and proposals to law. Uh, and as a backbench MP, knowing how to deploy those things, knowing what the questions are to ask a minister to, to bring, uh, to crystallize an issue and bring it to life uh, is really difficult when you're not a specialist in the subject. So if we're able to go and say, hey, I'm really concerned about water pollution. Can you ask a question in the house about how much of water pollution is from um, um, uh, runoff from, tr from transport uh, and what, what is the Department of Transport doing about it? It's that kind of um, help in structuring questions and motions and amendments that an MP needs uh, to be able to, to function in Parliament. That's their day-to-day -day mechanism. And again, the great uh, public lobbyist will be one who combines your own uh, sense of urgency about a cause with the kind of information and specificity that Bebout and others can provide uh, and discuss with you so that the MPs know what we're actually asking them to do that's within their power to do. Scooting through my last two points, um, knowing who the MP is, is really important. I'd always recommend if you're going to meet an MP, um, not in a sort of, um, uh, not in a sort of uh, a West Wing, um, Machiavellian uh, information data state way, uh, find out everything about them, but do look up who they are and what they care about uh, and try and, get, try and get a sense of the person you're speaking to. And that will give you a, um, a, a point of access and um, a way to relate what you care about with what they care about. So maybe their passion is public transport and maybe the way to talk about climate change emissions is to talk about creating a five minute neighborhood and making sure that buses and cycle routes are the way in, as opposed to going in with the message about uh, international doom or you must solve this tomorrow. And the other thing that that will help you do is remember that most MPs, like most of us, as I said at the beginning, don't want to be the villain of the piece. They want to be the good guy. And most MPs, most of the time, want to be, have entered public service and want to be the hero of a story. So if you go into a, a lobbying meeting and try to tell them a story and tell it in a way where you're writing them into the story as one of the good guys, as one of the heroes, nature's in decline. We've ignored it for too long. We need a target to... Um, create a legal obligation to halt nature's decline. There's a chance in the environment bill. If you go into the lobby and vote for amendment 24 to create a target to halt nature's decline by 2030, you can be part of the story of turning around nature's decline. Write them in to the narrative of saving the day uh, and help them to see their part in turning things around. Of course, there'll always be some MPs who are simply in it because they want a nice constituency where they can feel powerful for the rest of their lives. And they might be more interested in, in the cash and in the uh, status than in the issues. But in my experience from being a parliamentary researcher, a clerk in parliament, working in DEFRA, and now for many years working uh, as, a, as a, uh, an advocate for nature, that those are few and far between and most want to be the good guys in the story. And the final piece of the puzzle um, very quickly is to remember who we are. There will be lots of very highly paid advocates out on the other side of every debate that we enter into. For every um, time we get an MP meeting, there will be somebody from a major fossil fuel company, from a big developer who's being paid megabucks 
who's got bigger, better suits than we have, who've read that manual of how to do the perfect lobbying, who will go in and try to make the counter argument. What we have that they don't have is belief in what we're saying. And I guess that's the final thing that I would recommend for any lobbying meeting. The most important thing that we have on our side is truth and belief in what we're saying. And if you can remember not to be one of the sort of blank faced bureaucrats that MPs see all day long every day, but to be somebody with some fire in their eyes who cares about the issue and will speak politely but passionately about the need for change, that will stick in their minds and that will be the thing that helps to um, uh, helps to swing them in the right direction when the crunch point comes. So, um, MPs, we need to remember what they need, that political oxygen and ammunition of information and answers. We need to remember what they can do. They can ask questions, put motions, and put amendments to law. We need to remember who they are, remember that they're human and write them into a story where they're the good guys. And we need to remember who we are. Hopefully, we're usually on the right side of the argument and we're there because we care. And that's the most important thing. And if we get those things right, hopefully you'll be able to help your MP to see themselves not as that sort of comic book villain that we so often see in, um, in the media where a two-dimensional version of politicians is, is uh, left in place, but as that sort of comic book hero where they can be part of something bigger and better and help us to solve those seemingly intractable but ultimately urgent problems of environmental decline. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, passionate as always. And I think a key point that I'm taking that is that it's much better to provide MPs with solutions to the points you're asking them rather than just giving them problems. Um, there's plenty of questions uh, that have been thrown at you here, Richard, but we'll save those until the end. Um, so next, I'd like to invite um, Caroline Cole to speak. Um, Caroline is an environmental campaigner, um, Green Party councillor from West Berkshire Council. So we've had the sort of Westminster viewpoint and now a more uh, local view from Caroline. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Matthew. I would echo much of what Richard um, has just said. Uh, as Matthew says, I'm a Green Party councillor in West Berkshire. Um, I'm the Green Group leader on that council. Um, I've also helped Oxfordshire Green Party with their recent local elections and stood in the Cheshire and Amersham by-election last week. So I've been quite busy recently. Um, I also worked for Belt for a short uh, time back in 2008, 2019, which I enjoyed thoroughly and, and missed quite a lot, I have to say. Um, so in terms of lobbying your councillor, obviously there's the traditional things you can do, like picking up the phone and writing an email. And if you're not sure who your local councillor is, you can go onto the council website and look them up. And you may actually find that you have more than one councillor in your ward. So some of them are one member wards and some have two or even three members. So if you find that you contact one of them and you don't get a response, you can try the others as well. So there are different options. Um, I would say that it's important to personalise emails to them, and as um, Richard said, to try and provide information and solutions and not just pass on problems. So if a councillor receives lots of emails that have obviously just been sent automatically by um, an online petition site, it may be that they don't take as much notice of them as if you actually personalised the email and told them a bit more about your concerns and what you think the possible solutions are. Um, I think it's important to try and involve councillors in any campaigns that you're running. So perhaps you could say to them, can we come along and meet you? Can you come and meet us and see some of the things that we're doing on the ground? You know, can we show you our local projects, for example? Councillors like to get out and about and actually talk to people, meet people and find out about what they're up to. Um, I would caution that councillors, many of them, particularly opposition councillors, they don't have office staff. Um, they don't have a physical office often. So you do need to be patient with them with regards to waiting for um, an answer. Many of them work full time and being a counsellor is a part time job. So they'll often log into their emails once or twice a day, perhaps. Um, but you may find that you don't get an answer particularly quickly, uh, which would probably not be the case with MPs office because MPs have staff. 
Um, obviously, if your councillor happens to be in the um, cabinet or the leadership of the local council, they may answer you more quickly because they do have support. Uh, there are various mechanisms you can use to get your concerns across. So with West Berkshire Council, people can petition the council. So they can either do a paper petition or they can set one up online. And then eventually the leadership of the council has to respond to that petition. So with West Berkshire Council, we have a cabinet structure and ultimately all petitions have to have a response in a council meeting or in an executive meeting. So executive is basically another word for council. You might also have the opportunity to turn up to council meetings. So full council, usually three or four times a year, there will be opportunities for public questions. So you can go along and ask a question and get a response. Um, one of the things they do at West Berkshire, once you've asked your question, you can ask a supplementary. And the beauty of that is that they don't know what that supplementary question is going to be. And you can often get some quite useful, unexpected information out of the council by doing that. So that's an option that's worth pursuing. You can obviously write to your local newspaper, you can contact your local radio stations, and depending on where you live, you can make a judgment about whether you think that's going to have an impact, whether you think that that's a newspaper that has a high circulation. If it's you know three men and a dog that read it, you might decide that that's not such a good thing to do. But local councillors will read their local newspapers. They will listen to the radio and watch the local TV. So if you can build up momentum for your issue or campaign, they will take notice of that. Um, I would also say it's worth working with your local parish council. So you've got many layers of government, as you're probably aware, you've got your parish council, you've got districts and borough councils, and then you've got county councils. So it's worth working out who your councillors are for all of those different layers in your area and contact all of them because they will all have a part to play. So, for example, you might live in a village in a rural area or you might live in a town with a town council. Contact those councillors and try and get them to be allies with the district or borough or the county council level. So build up those alliances because that will have more influence on the district or county councillor. If they know that you as local volunteers and campaigners are concerned about an issue and you've been in touch with the parish councillors and they are similarly concerned, they are more likely to take notice of what you're saying. Also, it's worth thinking about building up alliances with local community groups. So we have West Berkshire Climate Action Network. I know there are lots of climate action groups across the country now. Again, build up alliances with them and also with local landowners. So in my ward, um, it's Ridgeway Ward in West Berkshire. It's a rural ward with many large landowners. Um, and yesterday I went to visit one of them at Yattenden Estates and had a tour around to look at what they're doing with their countryside stewardship grant. So again, they got their councillor to go out, to have a look around, to educate them, to give them information and to lobby them. So when you're pursuing a particular campaign, think about who are all the different people that I could work with on this? Who are my parish councillors? Do I have a local climate action group or climate action network? Can I work with local landowners who are similarly concerned about the impact on the environment and build those alliances with all of those different people? Um, from a cynical point of view, councillors want to be re-elected um, unless they decide they've had enough. Um, so I would use that to put pressure on the councillors and say, look, this is something that the local people are really, really concerned about and make a big issue out of it so that the councillor thinks that that is an issue which might have an impact on whether they're re-elected or not. So obviously you don't want to threaten people, but bear in mind that that is an ultimate concern for a councillor. You want them to take notice of you. So build up the impression that that issue is really, really important to the local people. And also I would say, don't give up on particular councillors. If you are in an area where you are really concerned about the environment, you might think, oh, the Conservatives won't be interested. The chances are the Conservatives will be extremely interested because, you know, conservatism with a small c often means that they are concerned about conservation and conserving life the way it is. And they don't like to see destruction of woodland, for example. So reach out to your councillors, no matter what party political persuasion they are. It's definitely worth doing. And seats do change hands. Um, 
in my seat, the Conservative majority was 66%, and then it became 62% Green in 2019. So people on the ground will change the way they look at issues and the way they vote, depending on what those councillors say, the kind of issues they talk about on the doorstep and the kind of pressure that you put onto those candidates. All of those things are worth considering. Um, and I would just say politics is extremely complex. Never give up on anybody. You can always persuade people. You can always build alliances. And sometimes, especially in these days of climate crisis, it can feel as if it's a lost cause. But I would say it's never a lost cause. Keep picking yourself up. Keep fighting because it's worth doing. Um, and finally, I would say that I think it's important not only that we engage in these traditional lobbying techniques and the focus on democracy and elective politics but we also think about direct action i think the two are both necessary we can't have one without the other if you have direct action then the politicians will set up and take notice of that and if you lobby the politicians and give them the information and the solutions that they need they can play their part as well so i think the two very very much go hand in hand um, and one of the things that I've been campaigning about is the HS2 campaign. And I know that BBOUT have done sterling work over the years, lobbying, surveying, doing research, et cetera, working with politicians. And obviously now the project is happening on the ground, there's a lot of people engaged in nonviolent direct action. And from having viewed both sides of that, I would say that the two go hand in hand and both are absolutely essential. There's a lot of survey work going on in woods at the moment, which HS2 has not bothered to do. So local people are very, very much engaged in that surveying work, in that research, and passing that information on to their elected representatives. So we, we can play many, many different roles, and all of them are very important. So I wish you all the best with your endeavours. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, lots of great points there, particularly the point about having to form sort of alliances and working in coalitions really to really maximise the voice around a particular issue. So that was a great local perspective, thank you. Thank and you. now from the other side of things, um, we're going to have a little presentation from uh, Val Siddiqui, who is an environment campaigner and wildlife ambassador for Beabout, um, to give the side of sort of the actual lobbyist. Um, so Val. All right, okay. Um, so, <clears throat> So yes, yeah, so, so many of the sites of the natural world that we used to take for granted are slowly disappearing and each successive generation regards what it sees as normal. Starling murmurations, um, swallows lining up on, uh, on, in their hundreds on telephone uh, wires, ducks of farmland birds, dead insects on windscreens, hedgehogs in gardens, wildflowers in meadows and roadsides. These are all examples of this decline that are commonly quoted and even in the last 10 years since I moved to Oxfordshire I no longer see barn owls, hares, frogs, hedgehogs and other wildlife with the same frequency and UK and uh, wide and local state of, of nature report, uh, um, reports have been reflecting this decline for many years. Then a couple of years or so ago an international study listed the UK as the 29th lowest out of 218 countries for biodiversity intactness. And for me this was the last straw and the catalyst that galvanized my, galvanized my resolve to campaign for nature. And incidentally quoting this statistic to my MP in my first meeting with him surprised him and grabbed his attention too and he wanted to know more. Climate change is thankfully getting more airtime these days, but nature's decline in both abundance and biodiversity still often, so often seems to be an afterthought. Yet nature can provide many solutions to mitigate climate change. It is not just about planting lots of trees. We need nature for our own health and well-being as well as for our survival. So I couldn't just sit back and let nature's decline happen without trying to do something about it. And to my mind, change won't happen the necessary urgency and less urgency and less supported both politically and in legislation. These days I'm finding more and more people feel the same. So when you meet your MP or your county or district councillor, or even when you write to them, brevity and clarity are key. You only get 10 minutes with your MP, so it's important to focus on the key points. You need to plan carefully what you intend to say. 
And I completely echo what Richard and Caroline have been um, saying in terms of, of, of what their recommendations are. I heard people say they're intimidated by the very thought of meeting their elected representatives. There really isn't any need to be. By researching your topic, planning your letter or your meeting and being clear about what action you wish them to take will increase your confidence. And if this doesn't work, you can always take a like-minded friend or a family member for moral support. It also helps, as Richard says, to know a bit about the person you're meeting. Are they interested in the natural world? What's their voting history on the environmental issues? Parliament's own website, council websites and individuals' own websites or social media accounts are good sources of this kind of information. For example, I discovered that my MP is chair of the River Thames All Party Parliamentary Group and is a strong porter of localism and neighbourhood planning, but also unfortunately of the Badger Coal. And understanding these interests enabled me to anticipate his reaction in the meeting and, and, and to foresee possible questions. By now I've met my MP and have written to him and to local councillors on many occasions. I've raised, raised a number of topics including nature recovery networks, the environmental, HS2, pesticide use and so on. And there are lots of sources of information to provide data and arguments for letters and meetings. Wildlife trusts in themselves provide great concise information to give you the key messages for particular campaigns. And I find reading environmental news from other sources also helps to get a greater all round understanding and gives me more confidence to re respond to any questions MPs or councillors might throw at me. I particularly find the BBC News and The Guardian are good on environmental reporting, as well as the RSPP, WWF, Wild, uh, Woodland Trust, Plant Life and, and others. <laughs> and I also follow wildlife campaigners and policy makers on social media, such as Tony Juniper, the head of Natural Ingham, Chris Packham, Wild Justice, Richard Benwell himself, of course, and the, and the Wildlife Cr Trust's Craig Bennett and Estelle Bailey. And of course, there are always Sir David Attenborough's brilliant documentaries and books, particularly those linking climate change and the state of nature. So what's my experience been? I found in-person meetings with my MP to be the most productive of the contacts we've had. I feel that I'm taken seriously and that over time he's become more attuned to the need to do more for nature, although we still have a number of areas of disagreement. I've learned that my MP doesn't sign pledges or have much time for mass lobbies or e-petitions. However, he did support the campaign for nature recovery networks and agreed to be photographed me, uh, with me alongside the Be Bout campaign banner. I had one telephone meeting with him during the first lockdown, but found this a more difficult experience. He doesn't, or didn't at least, seem to do Zoom, Zoom either. And letter writing is an altogether less personal activity. My MP always replies promptly to my letters, but his responses are clearly designed to cover any eventuality on a particular topic that a constituent might bring up. So the reply doesn't always properly address the exact angle I raised. On the other hand, I've received very encouraging and more personal responses from my local and, and, and county councillors. And of course, as Caroline says, we shouldn't forget our town and parish councillors who are responsible for managing some of our local green spaces, including in some cases our road verges, and so they can have a great impact at, at, lake, at local level. However, I still feel there is a lot of rhetoric from central government with plenty of sound bites, pledges and plans, and less by way of urgent implementation and legislative targets. The Environment Bill has still not reached the statute books, despite being put forward more than two years ago as the government's flagship legislation, and the Badger Call won't end until 2026. The pandemic has demonstrated, however, that we can respond quickly to emergencies. You only have to think how quickly vaccines have been developed and deployed, yet plans for nature's recovery seem to lack the same urgency. Despite this, though, the Blue Planet effect and the pandemic have contributed to an increase in public consciousness around the need to, to protect nature. The new Agriculture Act, Green Recovery, COP26 and the Has Got the Report, all of which have been mentioned, it does seem that the opportunity for change is there. 
and towards the end of May, Environment Secretary George Eustace announced measures to halt nature's decline, including setting targets, planting more trees, banning the use of peat, uh, uh, peat and returning species such as beavers and wildcats to the countryside. But as always, the devil is in the detail and pledges should be judged by action and implementation, and not just words alone. There's more detail on preparing for MPs meetings in my blog, at the link shown. I wrote it based on my experience of meeting my MP two years ago and securing his agreement for supporting nature recovery works. Campaigning has its ups and downs, but I'd like to end with a few words of encouragement from the great campaigner that is Sir David Attenborough. I'll leave you to read the quotes. Thank you, everybody, and I'll stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Val. That was really useful and interesting. I think that the best takeaway there, and what has been echoed in the chat as well, is don't be intimidated um, to meet your MP. Face-to-face -face meetings are the most effective, and uh, someone else feeling that they're our servants, not the other way around. So if you do get the opportunity to speak to them, do it in person. Yeah, don't feel scared about it. Excellent, there were three fabulous presentations. Thank you very much um, yeah, for all the tips and advice from all three of you. I'd like to hand over to Nikki now, who has been collecting the questions as they've been coming in to ask a few of them to our panelists. Yes, thanks, Matthew. Um, I've got several related questions actually, um, which Richard um, and Val possibly might want to comment on. Um, here's one from Zara. How do you take action further, especially with MPs that come back really slowly and often with blanket template responses? I recently contacted my local MP off the back of the Wildlife Trust End the Badger Car campaign and the response letter was really disappointing. I wasn't sure how much impact a response back to this would be or what action to take next. And I think this is um, probably something that quite a few um, people have struggled with. Um, I don't know, Richard, did, if you have anything to say on that. It, it is really frustrating when you get those um, pro forma responses that uh, have come from somewhere central, but don't take it personally and don't give up, I think, are the, 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 the main things. And um, it's always worth, if you can, picking up the phone to follow up with an MP's office. Uh, and uh, if you've got something that's really um targeted and important to speak about then try and request that personal meeting that val spoke so well about that the difference between being able to eyeball somebody and just write on the page is so important so if you can follow up that way then do uh, and if there are ways that you can um try and uh, engineer cooperative approaches that's also really important so as uh, caroline said before te teaming up works really well if you can find a local um, local wildlife group, uh, uh, a community group uh, to be able to uh, reach out with together and um, create a, a platform for your MP. Uh, there's nothing like a, a speaking opportunity to, to draw, um, draw in an MP who's interested in their local community. So give them that opportunity and use that to engineer a chance to, to speak. Um, last thing i'd just say very quickly is that you never know how things have gone down so even if you do get one of those template answers it doesn't mean that the the issue that you raised hasn't been taken seriously it might be that it's provoked um a conversation in the corridors of power somewhere that your mp is speaking on your behalf um uh, to ministers but is is unable to say at this point what they really want to say. So um, it can be discouraging, but it doesn't mean it's not working and, and try those other routes in too. Thanks, Richard. I, I guess um, there's some, some questions here as well, which relate to um, MPs who always take their party line and how on earth do you get them to um, speak out on something you've raised if they're determined to just follow their party line? And I guess your advice to the previous question would apply to that as well. 
it it, it would and um try, trying to get them to intercede with with a minister mm. or to um pr take a, a, a probing question um is a way to um encourage them to do something that's different from having to make a really difficult decision for them on a vote so if you can before it gets to that sort of um uh zero hour of having to go down the yes lobby or the no lobby try and get them to do something else for you um why minister are we going to do it this way get them to write into the to the boss um give them give them the most questions that they can ask it's a it's a less um uh, it's a less scary prospect for an mp uh, and unfortunately very few are brave enough to break the, the party whip but you can get them to do things that help to change what the whip will be next time brilliant thank you um for um val or caroline um, we've got a question here from Sarah. How do you find other local campaigners or groups who are lobbying on the same topic? And how do you go about joining forces in your community? I wonder, Val, I know that you've got some experience of this. I wonder if you'd like to say something and maybe Caroline as well. well it's an interesting question. I mean, I'm lucky enough to have um, a local nature group here, um, which has given me um, a few contacts and, and, and networks. Um, um, but I find going to um, things like the, the TVERC um, recorders conference, for example, you meet lots of people there who are interested in nature. And by talking to them, um, you can uh, either join up with their organisations or with them as individuals, or they can point you in the direction of um, of, of other organisations that it might be useful uh, to team up with. And I think just generally, just talking amongst friends and, and relations and developing a network helps you to, um, to, to expand your influence um, and, um, uh, and, and make your voices collectively heard more loudly. Sure, and I would add to that, um, looking on social media is a good way to find out who else is operating in your area. So investigate whether or not there's a local climate action network or climate action group. Um, and I think just network ferociously, basically, try and find out who the local uh, political groups are, the climate action network. Um, you might have local shops that have started selling things that are more environmentally friendly. You know, get in touch with the local charities, see if they've got local branches. Friends of the Earth, for example, often have active branches. Um, in Newbury, we've had something called Lockdown Wood, where people have planted lots of trees um, that are going to be dedicated to the memory of people who died during the COVID pandemic. So there are all kinds of little projects that are going on. And if you can meet those people and talk to them, you might find issues of, of common interest, which you can then take forward when you lobby. Um, and just going back to the previous question, if you find that you don't get much traction with your MP, you could try going to your local councils because they might actually have more influence than you would as an individual or group of individuals. So, for example, um, I will often talk to the Conservative leadership of the local council and say, can we lobby our MP about a particular issue? Whereas if I did it directly myself, I might not get very much traction. So those sort of tactical considerations need to be made as well. That's really helpful, thanks. Um, and on the subject of social media, which you just mentioned, um, what impact would you think Twitter attention on an issue has? And do you think that social media has changed the way we lobby? I think Facebook is probably a more friendly place than Twitter. Twitter tends to be bubbles of people engaged in an ongoing slanging match, really. And I don't think that it really changes people's views on things, particularly uh, Facebook. I think you can find more collaborative um, spaces like the Climate Action Network I've just mentioned. We've got a very lively group locally which shares all sorts of information about how you can get grants to insulate your home, you know, how you can get grants for community orchards various meetings that are happening that people might be interested in going to, all, all kinds of stuff like that. So I think, you know, Facebook is a good space um, and maybe think about setting up a local Facebook group. Um, sign up to all your local um, town council, parish council, village Facebook pages and use those, you know, monitor those and think, who are the people who might be interested in this issue um, and how can I work together with them? 
but yeah, I think Twitter is a pretty evil place to be sometimes. I think I think Facebook is much better. And Richard, I wonder, did you have any views on um, how social media has changed the way we lobby? The, the different tools serve different functions. So as Caroline said, it's um, Facebook's a good place for for actually creating communities and trying to have slightly more enriched conversations. But but Twitter campaigns really can work. Um, I didn't join Twitter till till quite late, but was amazed when when finally um, when finally I did. First of all, how annoyingly addictive it is, and how many minutes of a day you can easily lose. Uh, but uh, but secondly, just just how um, direct a point of contact it can be. Um, MPs can be swung by by Twitter campaigns. Civil servants really do uh, read what's going on um, and follow blogs and uh, and pay attention uh, and sometimes it can you know it can ping straight to an MP's phone uh, much more directly than um, the, the circuitous route of uh, letter into office into meeting booking and round it can be so instant and live so um, using the right tool at the right moment is um, and so I've, I've yet to discover what the proper application of um, what's that one where they sing about the weller man uh um what do i mean TikTok. yes i've yet to i've yet <laughs> to uh try a TikTok campaign but uh but maybe the day will come thank you and richard um specifically for you do you think it's a good idea to send mps articles and websites would they have time to read them or do you think not most mps as i'm sure most you know most mps inboxes don't go to the mps themselves they'll go to a team and most of the replies that you receive. Um, it varies from MP to MP, but but many MPs may never actually have read your message, even if you get what looks like a reply from them. It will often be from their offices uh, rather than from the MP themselves. Uh, and so I would always um, try to toward more formal uh, engagement and uh, structured messages rather than something that might feel like a more chatty and discursive way of going about something, you know, like you might zap your friend a link, uh, expecting them actually to read it. Well, just imagine that your friend's not actually reading it, their office person is instead. Uh, and that's a good guide. Just a, a very quick, very quick note, if you, can, if you can get to know who works in the offices, then often they can be extremely influential folk themselves uh, and some MPs use their researchers as a as a second brain um, and the researchers really need information so if you can get a relationship with them first of all it's polite because they're the person you're really speaking to but second they'll be the ones who are writing a lot of the speeches or writing the questions and they need help with the research so if you can get that kind of real life relationship with it with the office that's helpful but in general I wouldn't imagine that an MP will read a lot of links or, or newspaper articles if you're sending those across. Thanks, Richard. Um, Val, I think that you've had some success contacting your um, MPs, researcher or, or uh, office assistants, haven't you? Yes, that's right. I mean, I, I, I've discovered that um, my uh, MP's uh, assistant seems to be extremely interested in the environment and nature. So. Um, uh, I always copy her in on my um, formal uh, emails uh, so that um, I, I feel like it, it, it's getting um, uh, more attention. But yes, I, I have found that very useful. Brilliant. Um, right, I think we need something really upbeat from everybody. We've got a question here from Justin. Why does it always feel such an uphill battle? To what extent is it basically the desire for money and human short termism? So um, maybe if uh, I don't know if each of you would like to um, give us something uh, motivating and upbeat in reply to that one, um, Richard. Uh oh, third would have been helpful on this one. It, it, it is. I mean, it is really an uphill battle. And uh, that's where it comes back to understanding that it's really hard for those MPs too, because they are de trying to hopefully deconstruct a system that has been taking from nature for decades, for centuries. 
you know, we're trying in what we're doing together now to deconstruct the worst of, of um, consumerism excess, uh, deconstruct the world where we just judge value on GDP and build up a new way of thinking about our relationship with the natural world. That's huge. So it's bound to feel like an uphill struggle. But the excitement of the public attention that's on is at the moment, the, um, the opportunity to make real gains from these big bits of legislation that are up in front of us at the moment, they're real. Uh, and, and we really can win some amazing stuff this year in particular with the global spotlight on us. So um, get campaigning now and let's get it in the statute book so that when they think about something else, we've locked it into the law. Brilliant. Thank you. Caroline? Yeah, I think in the future, if we are going to tackle climate change and various other challenges, we're going to need more local solutions. And I think one of the good things about campaigning locally is you do build up those coalitions of people with similar concerns and interests, and that can be quite empowering. So the HS2 campaign is one example. People on the ground have formed campaigns between the local people, the local parish councils, people who've come into the area to protect the trees, etc. And that can be incredibly empowering, whereas writing to an MP and constantly being ignored or getting a stock response can perhaps be disappointing. So I think we need to do all of these things and just try to empower ourselves basically to, to make new friends, to educate ourselves and really understand the issues. Um, so I would say, you know, get out there on the ground and, and get stuck in and that will give you a real sense of, of power over the situation. And you can do many things at a local level, you know, you can create community orchards, plant trees, set up community shops, all of that kind of thing. Um, and that can give you a bit of hope if the more sort of political lobbying is, isn't getting you anywhere particularly quickly. Brilliant, thanks. Val, did you have anything to add? Yes, I mean, I think it does feel like an uphill battle sometimes, but um, I think events like this, where you um, can be reminded that so many people feel the same way as you and, and, and are motivated to uh, um, make things change and make things happen, I, I find that really quite inspirational. And um, I think uh, um, in, in some ways, I feel one of the reasons that um, politicians um, aren't as responsive sometimes as we would like is that they don't feel that they know what it is they need to do. I think sometimes the, the um, cl climate change solutions are, are probably more easy to articulate and are more obvious, but what to do about nature's decline is, is a lot more difficult. And so I, I think more they, they do need more information and uh, more help. And, and we as individuals need to try and strike a balance between local initiatives and um, lobbying MPs because whilst they are very important in terms of providing the legislation and, 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 uh, and the um, uh, overall background to all of this, um, we're all in it together and local initiatives are equally important. Thank you very much, Val. Well, we're going to start wrapping things up, I'm afraid, because we're getting to the end. So I'd like to thank um, Estelle, Richard, um, Caroline and Val for speaking and Nikki for moderating the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all the questions. There were lots, but we got through as many as we could. Um, I hope that was useful for everyone. Um, it's great seeing the chat that some people are already saying they're going to write their MPs this afternoon. Um, and if we've inspired just one person to do that, then today has been worthwhile. Um, please do feel free to get in touch with BBAD if you have any follow-up questions. This will be put on our website, um, so share it. Um, and thank you all for joining and thank you all for um, giving the time to join because that shows that you are dedicated to this cause. And I'm sure together with everyone pulling in the same direction, um, we can achieve the great things in the environment bill that Richard mentioned. We can all um, engage with our councillors, like Caroline said, and we can all be as inspiring as Val to never give up the fight. Um, so thank you very much, all, and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.